many people don't know they exist, even Americans at times. Uh, so I'd explain it that uh, these sites uh, overseas um, are memorials uh, to the sacrifice that American service members made outside of the United States um, in a cause to uh, propel or make ensure that uh, uh, an ally uh, retained its liberty and its freedoms. Um, and uh, these sites are here to commemorate those actions throughout throughout Europe, throughout North Africa, um, and uh, that that's what these sites are. That's what they represent. They represent the sacrifice America made uh, to its allies in order that they retain and uh, retain their liberty. What happened here, and the reason that we're here, this site was located, is this cemetery commemorates the Normandy campaign. Uh, for the United States Army, the Normandy campaign starts on the 6th of June and ends with the liberation of Paris on the 25th of August, 1944. So those service members who died during that campaign on the fields of combat would be buried here in Normandy. I, I think for any visitor, regardless of where he's from, it can be overwhelming because the site is set up to be overwhelming. That is to say, it's a very gentle, beautiful entry. You almost feel like you're in a park. Uh, beautiful, uh, everything everything is trimmed, uh, the trees are pretty, um, and you bend, uh, turn around the bend and you see the, the, the o Omaha Beach, it's just, it's gorgeous. The Omaha Beach where initially before the, uh, the uh, occupation by Derby were called the Golden Beaches of France. They're probably the most beautiful beaches of France is right here. Um, you see that and then you go a little further and you see that thousands of crosses and there's a, a, a real shift in your um, in, in, in what you feel. It's, it's not sadness, but it is overwhelming. And it was we call, we call that interpretive threshold. That is you, you come through like a curtain and now your mind is really, really focused on uh, why, why are these men here? Why are they laid out, well, laid out perfectly in rows? Why are they intermingled? Um, and so it's a feeling of being overwhelmed. Um, for an American, it's also a feeling of pride. Uh, for a foreigner, it's a feeling of a uh, little more respect for America. When you come around the corner and say they, they really go out of their way uh, to uh, recognize the sacrifice of their service members. But I think it's, it's, not a, it's not a sad place. I don't think visitors get the feeling it's a sad place. But it is definitely a place made uh, to make you think um, uh, of, of, of what real sacrifice uh, means and that there's a cost to, to freedom. People have been paying it for a long time, long before America even existed. Um, and though the cost is very heavy, it's necessary. Anytime you meet a veteran, it's a humble experience because uh, they almost get offended if you tell them they're a hero. Then almost all of them will tell you I'm no hero. I, uh, I was uh, in an army of millions of other men. I came on a boat with, uh, with, with men. I was, I was no braver. I was not a better shot. We were all in the same uh, situation. Um, but uh, I met a veteran. Um, who had uh, done uh, this, came in on the second wave here um, in Normandy. He was a member of the 16th Infantry Regiment. His name was Frank Moore. Um, 
And Frank explained to me uh, the day of uh, the landing here, he came in on the second wave. He was the last man on the left-hand side of his boat. And he told us it was the worst place to be because that's where the diesel exhaust was. And uh, there are 34 men in front of Frank and they're all vomiting because it's very rough. And he says the vomit hits the sea spray, makes its way back. So he said, then I began to vomit I filled up my vomit bag. It took two and a half hours. People think that uh, from coming from the big boats to here took 15 minutes, like saving Private Ryan. That's not the case. It took two and a half hours. These men were standing up the entire time, uh, chest to shoulder. Uh, but Frank told me that they had been given orders by their officers not to throw themselves over the side of the boat because they would drown. They were carrying 75-pound packs. And most of the boats didn't hit the sand. They hit a sandbar, which Normandy is full of. The gate opens, men run out and fall into 8 to 12 feet of water. Their 75 pound pack now weighs 125. They're being shot at. There's no place to hide. Um, Frank said that only two people from his entire boat survived the landing. Uh, Frank fought for eight more weeks, and after eight weeks, he's the only remaining member of his, his initial 132 man company. Uh, the others have been wounded, uh, prisoners of war, killed, most wounded. Uh, the command decided to do something for Frank Moore. They said, this young kid's already seen enough. He's seen eight weeks of, of, of the landing and fighting through the hedgerows. So they send him to a training uh, um, division here in, in, uh, in, Western, in, in Western France. He spent several months training new divisions arriving. Uh, then he's put into a division himself, and it's one of the divisions that, that's surrounded at the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, Frank tells me that in the Belgium area in December they were repulsing their sixth attack of the morning. They've been attacked six times in one morning. And that his rifle misfired. And uh, he explained immediate action on M1 Garand like he was a drill instructor from the Marine Corps. He, he hasn't forgotten anything in, in, in 60 years. He knows, he went through every single step. He said that didn't work. So he said at that point he knew he had to completely field it, disassemble a weapon in the middle of a firefight. So he said, I took my glove off, and he's telling me the story, and he says, I took my glove off, and he put his hand up, and he said, my trigger finger had been shot off. That's why my gun wasn't working. He said, I hadn't felt my hands or fingers for three days. And, that's, and Frank was here because after the war he became one of America's top uh, fly fisherman guides in the state of Oregon. And when I met Frank, he was 90 years old. He was still working every day as a guide. And he was here to fish the streams that he had fought through. That's why Frank was here. Um, but veterans have all kinds. And for a lot of veterans, you've got to drag these stories out of them. They, we see that a lot. We have families who tell us that my father's never spoken about this war till he got here. He got here, he saw, he saw and, and he, says, he told us stuff today we've never heard, never. They, these men tended to go home and just go back to work uh, because it involved so many of them um, that they felt they were all in the same boat and they just, they just returned to America. And, and not only did this generation help win a war, this generation really changed America. We became super rich after World War II because these men went to work and they built cars, they built houses, they built communities. Um, and uh, that, that's why I think they're the best generation. But that was a moving story because it's a story of, uh, I mean, it's, I, I, can't, I can't even believe, I uh, can't even understand what Frank fought through. And, and to see him, when I saw him, he's holding his wife's hand like they were high school sweethearts. You know, it, is, it was his wife for, forever. Um, and just how humble he was and how grateful he was and how self-serving he was. Um, it was just, um, it was just great. I've, I've, but I've talked to lots of veterans and, uh, uh, they, uh, never, and I'll, I'll never pass up that opportunity. It's, uh, I've learned something every day. I've learned to be a, a better person myself, uh, just by, uh, by the impression these veterans have left on me.
o quiere ir arriba. I'd say uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for what you did for America. Thank you for making America uh, the great country uh, that it was. I'm sorry it's not the great country now. It seems to be, we, we, we tend to throw rocks at each other in America today. Uh, I think a lot of these veterans would be disappointed. I don't know where we went. I, I, I have an idea, a personal idea of where I think we went wrong. Um, but the truth of the matter is, as much and many Americans get offended when I say this, but America's fought lots of wars. The last one we won was this one. This is the last war we won. And I was a soldier, and I can, t I, can, I can tell you this is truly, the last war we won was this one. Every war after that we've tied, we hope, we think, we tell ourselves, or we've lost. And so... Uh, uh, the, the best financed army in the world, uh, with all its great generals, uh, when I see a general today, I had generals, I had a couple generals this morning. And, uh, you know, I was a three-star general I fought here, and, and, and the back of my mouth I really want to say, but you didn't win. You didn't, we haven't won a war since, since then. That's the last war we, we fought, and we've got to start asking ourselves, why is that? I can guarantee you on the 6th of June, the guy next to him didn't care if, if the guy next to him was a Republican or Democrat. Most of them didn't have, weren't affiliated to political parties to begin with. Um, I think what's going on in the world today is, is the world is, has become tr uh, tribal. That's to say in America, if, you're, if, you're, if your neighbors are a Democrat, you're, you're a Republican, you're automatically, there's a need to not like him, I think it's foolish. Uh, I think at the end of the day, titles or political parties solve nothing. Uh, we probably have given them too much importance. Uh, I think if we gave them less importance and just asked them to do their job on a daily basis and held them accountable, uh, because in America today, uh, we've, been, we've been investigations for seven to eight years. We're really good at that. The problem is you use an excuse to not pass a budget, which we're unable to do and we're required by law to do so. I think uh, beyond all that, uh, they, these, are, these are cyclic historically and we're, we're going to get over it. Um, I wish it didn't take so long, uh, but for us, um, the, the VIPs are not Republicans, Democrats, presidents, senators, congressmen, governors, they're uh, private, private first classes, they're four-star generals. Uh, those are the VIPs, and uh, when we um, when we welcome, uh, and we do a lot, uh, congressional delegations, presidents, uh, we attack our job is that they're not the VIPs, they're here to visit the VIPs, and uh, that way you keep a very level head and you don't forget uh, what you're here to do, which is to let let the, those people know what the VIPs were capable of under much harder conditions than staying in offices all day and being on the internet. Uh, so we tr we are, we're apolitical. We don't, uh, we don't get involved in politics, but we could most certainly learn something from the generation. They're called the best generation in America. And for, as a young soldier myself, I, I'll, I'll, and I spent 23 years in the service, I often ask myself before I came here, well, what makes their generation any better than mine? I went to war three times. Uh, I went to three deployments. Uh, it only took me a little while being here finding out I couldn't do this. There's no way I could do this. No, it wasn't. So they were the best generation. They weren't only the best generation militarily. I think they were, uh, they were honest people. They were hardworking. Most of them are products of a depression. Uh, our liberties were still young compared to the rest of Europe. We're st today we're still young. I mean, there are, there, there are houses in, in the village older than my country. Um, and so I think um, uh, they have a lot to teach us if we're willing to listen. Um, that to really get things done, you've got to, it requires sacrifice, maybe not death. Maybe we need to work a little harder. Maybe we need to complain a little less. Maybe we need to get uh, stop thinking of ourselves individually. Um, 
because that's a problem in America now. An 18-year-old gets out of high school. He wants to design an app and become a millionaire. And when you tell him that's really not how it works, uh, you got to push a lawnmower maybe a little bit. Uh, they don't understand. So, but I think in, in the long run, that'll all come out in the wash. It will, uh, the world has a way of writing itself, whether we, we, are, we, are, we want to or not. And um, so we don't get too involved in politics here. Just to say that, that uh, when we greet senators and congressmen and governors, and most of them are very good people, we don't attack our job as to, I, our, we don't attack our job as that we're here to please them, we're here to educate them. Um, this, is, this is what these guys did. Uh, and this is how they did it, and this the cost. And hopefully they get back on that bus and think, maybe I ought to work a little harder, maybe I ought to get results. Um, and at the end of the day, I can go to bed and say, well, I did this today and I was successful, not I'm preparing for tomorrow's debate <laughs> and the next day's debate and the next year's debate, because we're really good debaters. We're just not getting, we're not moving forward very well, very quick. <laughs>